Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. On this episode, we are going to visit the tumultuous time period of the successors. Nope, nope, we're not doing this successor game, one could say THE successor game, although as you can see I still own it, one of the GMT copies, but that's something I might do in the near future. But now this successors is from s and issue number 161 from June of 1993. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at here. Now, the successors of course is the time period referred to, the Didaka is also a term that's used, of uh, the generals who succeeded Alexander the Great when his empire fell apart basically after his death and all the tumultuous stuff that went on there. I mean, you can read whole books on the subject. Um, hang on one second. Just to give you an idea, because I'm currently reading a biography of Pyrrhus of Ephorus. More about that in the future. But, you know, I got this two volume set The Wars of Alexander's Successors, Commanders and Campaigns. And then there's the companion book, Volume 2 The Wars, um, Battles, and Tactics of them. So there's whole books written on this uh, particular topic if you're interested in it. But what I'm going to do here is just show this gameplay. Um, honestly, it's kind of a very fun, light. Uh, easy breezy beer and pretzel game is the term is usually used, but it can be a lot of fun multiplayer and quite frankly it, it's fun to play every once in a while solo too for reasons that I'll get into here in a little bit and I have some solo tweaks that of course naturally I'm working on and developing um, because as you all know I'm primarily a solo player. Okay, so real quick it's very simple there are four different factions in the game if you look here you can see the four different factions you've got red green yellow and blue okay each player begins and it's determined randomly who gets to place first you get to place a home marker down so for example here yellow got to place early so you can see there they placed it in Egypt whereas green went into the middle of Asia Minor and Phry Phrygia I believe is the proper pronunciation the uh, blue faction went into Macedonia and in true Alexandrian fashion, the red faction went down to Babylon. I'll talk about what that 12 is here in a moment. Okay. Now, the provinces, and we'll just use Babylon here, uh, provinces are defined by their borders. There's basically two types of provinces and three types of game spaces in the entire game. You've got basically a very fertile, clear area like Babylon. You've got a more difficult terrain like West Arabia. And basically the movement allowance is one versus two. And then, of course, you also have your sea zones like the Black Sea up here to the north of Asia Minor. Going back to Babylon here, and let's just come out just a little bit. You can see that each province has an economic value. That's, of course, how you raise and maintain. Yes, you have to pay to maintain your people here, uh, the value of it. And then these little symbols at the bottom tell you what kind of units you can raise from that province. Now, this is important because you can only raise units in the game from provinces that you control that have the symbols. So, for example, if you don't have a fleet symbol in one of your provinces, you can't build any fleets. So... That is critical, and it's also very important because in this game, unlike a lot of other games, you cannot cross the Bosporus and the Dardanelles without a fleet. Okay, There is no allowance for that. So to get from Greece to Asia Minor, you need a fleet, which I mean, technically, in my mind anyway, makes a lot of sense because you know naval voyages at this point in time uh, were just extremely treacherous. Uh, all you have to do is take a look at um, the map to... Um, the Ancient World Volume 2, Carthage, uh, the First Punic War, and just look how it shows you the big difference uh, when you're doing naval movement if you stick near the coast of, say, Sicily. But if you try to go directly across from Sicily to um, uh, basically Tunisia, where Carthage was, you know, that's they get into a lot of extra points and stuff that basically you roll a die and see if there's any kind of disaster with your fleet. So that all makes sense to me. The white pieces, um, as you can see, probably there's a few of them you saw in the wide shot, but let me go over here to Rhodes. The white pieces are independent. 
um, pieces in the game. Nobody controls them. They represent um, independent kingdoms or revolts as the game unfolds, which is possible. Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. Now, again, I have adjusted some of these rules for solo play. Um, the rules on this are very simple. It's very straightforward, but the game is still extremely entertaining. Um, it still is a lot of fun. It's obviously even more fun if you play with multiple people, which I'm hoping someday, um, you know, my wife would play a game like this. You know, this would be right up her alley. Um, area movement and a simple combat system. So maybe my boys, when they get a little bit better, hey, we'll be able to play a four-player game in the forever future. Uh, hopefully in a decade or so, shall we say. Yeah, a decade would be good, because one would be 13 and the other one would be 11. And I'll be, ooh, let's not talk about that. All right, so let's get rolling. Okay, so every single game turn, and down here, on the bottom, you can see there is the game turn track. There are 10 turns total in the game. Every game turn begins the same. You start by rolling a die, or rolling for, I should say, a random event. Um, now, there are random events in this game, and each player at the beginning of their player turn rolls for random events. So that you're going to get a lot of generated random events in this game, which to me is part of what makes this game work and what makes it fun and makes it takes it from something like, um, oh, you know, like Risk or Axis and Allies and takes it up to another step because, uh, in my opinion, um, and of course you can look these up, I'm sure, online and stuff, but the, a lot of thought went into the event tables. Um, and there's a lot of events, which I'll explain here in just a minute. Okay. Now, typically, if you're playing the game, there's a starting player each turn, and then you know you go around the table. However, for the purposes of this game, and again, it, it can affect balance issues, what I do is I roll a die from each faction, and then high die roll wins and goes first each turn. Okay. So, yellow won the die roll, so yellow is going to roll first. Now, when you roll the dice, you actually, for events, you roll three dice. Okay. The first one, the gray one here, the gray one tells you whether you're going to use the odd or even event table. So like I said, there's a lot of events here. So there's one whole set of tables using the um, tens and ones method with two dice. So like 11, 12, all the way up to 66. And then uh, there's an entire separate one, odd and even for that. So here, yellow, the gray die represents which one it's going to be. Well, it's going to be the even. And then tens and ones, it's going to be 21. Blackjack. Okay? So once we have the die roll of that, that's always the first thing you do each turn. Then you're going to find out on the even table what is 21. Well, let's take a look here together. 21 is right here. So it's a gift. So the roller receives one talent point. Now, talent points, of course, are basically the money of the game, okay? And there's a track over here on the left to keep track of. That's using track perhaps a bit too oftenly um, in that sentence, but it keeps track of down over here uh, how many talents that you have each turn, okay? So that's always the first thing you do. So again, playing solo, there's all kinds of events that can pop up, and you'll see that as I do this playthrough um, that can really you know, alter strategies and, and affect things a lot, okay? So first thing you always do is you do your random events. Second thing you do is money, 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 money. You collect your money from whatever territories that you control. So let's look at the Yellow Empire, which basically would have been the equivalent of Ptolemy, um, the Egyptian empire there. Uh, I always find it fascinating and a little funny um, how... You know, everybody thinks so when they think of Egypt in the ancient world, usually the first thing they think of is Cleopatra. Uh, most people don't realize that that's not even an Egyptian name, it's Greek. Because the Ptolemies ruled Egypt until, well, basically till um, Caesar Augustus um, knocked them off, so to speak. Um, and I think that was 31 BC, if memory serves. I haven't studied the ancient world in a while, I'll be honest about that. But, because um, Alexander the Great actually even had a sister named Cleopatra. So... Yellow Empire, there's the home marker. They start there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to total up the value of all the provinces. Remember the red number circled, um, and the white circle, I should say, to figure out how much money we get. So we got 6, 8. 8 and 3 is 11. 12. 13. And 3 is 16. 18. Oh, Blackjack. 21 added to our 2 gives us 25. Woo! 
So, rich, rich, rich. Okay, first thing you do, collect your talents. Now, you cannot collect talents from a province that is contested. So if there are units from both sides in the province, nobody gets the money. Okay, so you got to keep that in mind. And nobody gets the victory points uh, at the end. You score victory points, obviously, for the provinces that you control. I mean, that's basically the measure of victory in this game. Um, to determine who wins, it, it all boils down to how many provinces that you end up controlling. Okay, um, so you get them from provinces, and also how much money you have left in your treasury too. So you want to keep an eye on your money because your money, um, every talent gets you half a victory point at the end. So you might want to have some nice coffers, so to speak. So this game lets you, or I should say encourages you to be fiscally responsible. <laughs> okay, so we got 25. Now, first thing we have to do is we got to pay for everybody who's on the board. Okay, it only costs one talent point per unit to pay for them. So let's count them up and see how much money we have to do here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13. So there goes half of our money. Um, we're just going to take us down to 12 talents. Okay. Now, now, when you build new units, you have two options as to where to place them. You can either place them in your home territory, or if you look up here in, I believe this is northern Syria. Yes, north Syria. Everybody has one leader. Okay. So in order to place units, they have to be placed with the leader or they have to be placed um, in the home province itself. Now, it does say in the rules, as I said before, that you have to control a province that has that kind of um, unit that you can basically extract from that province. However, it doesn't say you have to build it in that province. And the reason that I specifically point that out as it mentions fleets because fleets have two different costs. It's three if you build them in a port, but five if it's built in a non-port coastal province. Okay, most of the places where the fleet symbols are um, on this is basically, you know, you have your port symbol here like Egypt, but you could build one here in Libya, which of course, like I said, that means that well, you don't necessarily have to build it in Egypt. You could build it in Libya. You could build it in Palestine. It just costs more to do that. Okay, but you must control the space with the symbol in order to build that kind of unit. Okay, all right. So what I think I'm going to do here, since yellow is really kind of driving deep into um, the Middle East here, along the Levant region here, um, red's kind of been a little down lately. So I might try to go pound on green and invade Cappadocia. But I also have to kind of keep an eye over here because Blue has built some fleets. Now, Blue's problem has been twice in the game so far. They've already had um, barbarians invade into Yuria. So um, that's something to consider, too. Okay. So now I'll go ahead and total up the cost of my units. Now, basically, there's a couple different types of units in the game. There are levy troops that cost one talent point. There's regular infantry that costs two. Uh, cavalry costs three and fleets either cost three or five. Now elephants can only be built by a random event so you kind of have to keep that in mind too. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to spend some of my talents I think on a couple of fleets to protect the home province. Okay. Now if you lose your home province in the game you're still in the game. Okay. So that's six there so that takes me down to six talents left over and with those six talents, I'm going to go ahead and build some more units here. I'm going to build two infantry and a levy, leaving myself one talent just in case I need it. And of course, talents in multiplayer games, um, you can make agreements, you can, you can exchange talents, you can do all kinds of stuff and negotiating and things. Um, you can form alliances. But in this kind of game, I just kind of... Well, in this game, I'm just kind of playing each side itself without looking at any kind of alliances and such. Um, I have been working on um, solo roll tables to not only just reflect like negotiating diplomacy between different powers, but also to reflect um, attitudes. You know, like is somebody aggressive, is somebody going to fortify, you know, those kind of things, or expand into an empty space, that kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to put these new units here. Uh, I'm going to put one in Egypt, just as a garrison, one of the stronger infantry. And then I'm going to put a levy and some infantry up here 
in North Syria. Now, units in the game can move if they don't have a leader with them. Um, that's legal. It's, it's allowable. It doesn't really change anything. Leaders are important for combat. We'll get to that here in a minute. Okay. Now, green is weakened. So, I mean, I could do one of two things here is yellow. I could drive into Cappadocia and basically try to wipe green out. Or I could go up here into Armenia and basically try to put the kibosh on red. Now, that would give green a chance to bounce back. But... At the same time, they could weaken both of my opponents and give the opportunity for uh, basically, you know, getting the, giving them both a good solid hit and then eventually knocking them down um, to the point where they're both weak enough that I can take them both out single-handedly, so to speak. And then blue, well, blue is just in trouble. So yellow has got the upper hand here. Clearly, um, you know, clearly at this point in time. All right, so let's see. Um, you know what? With that thought in mind, I am going to march into Armenia. Okay. Now, basically, all units have a movement ability of three points. Leaders can actually move four points. Okay. And again, a clear province like this um, is one movement point. The darker ones are two, and that's basically it. That's the only difference there. Okay. All right. Now. Once you're done moving, and again, you can move as many units as you want. There's no stacking limits in this game. There's no zones of control, nothing like that. This is a very strategic game. Uh, then you have your battles. Now, if there's cavalry present, then you have a pre-battle resolution, okay? Where basically you can inflict damage on the enemy before the battle proper gets rolling here. However, that can be canceled by elephants. As you can see here, yellow has an elephant. For every elephant that you have, it will cancel out two enemy cavalry uh, for their pre-battle attack. So that's going to kind of take care of that. Now, both sides then fight, and it's simultaneous. So basically, you roll all the dice, and you total up the hits. Speaking of which, let's just drop down here. There we go. As you can see here in a regular battle, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, Cavalry and regular infantry need a five or six. So this is a combat system that's a hit system. Okay, elephants and levies are six, and then leaders will give a plus one to any unit. So if you put a leader with an infantry unit, then you need a four, five, or six to score a hit. All right, so here we go. So let's do the Battle of Armenia. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a very bad thought. I'm debating whether I should verbalize it. It's like a tough battle, because, you know, it's hard. Ah, America's fascination with the Kardashians just baffles me. Anyway, moving along. So, I'll go ahead and fire off yellow first here. So, elephants need a six to hit. So, let's see if we get any hits with the elephants. Oh, okay. So far, so good. There's one. Awesome. And then we've got one, two, three. We got four regular infantry. We need to hit on a five or a six. Well, hmm. Looks like the infantry... Had a little bit of trouble there, trying to get into the flow of things in the battle here. They only got one hit there. And now the leader, of course, will roll with his infantry unit, which is a four, five, or six needed to hit. Yikes. He only got a one. Okay. So basically, cleaning up here, that only scored two hits for yellow. All right. Not so good. If you're old enough to remember those Bud Light commercials. I think that was Bud Light. All right. Now the opposing side. So one, two, three, four. So there's four infantry here. Let's see what kind of damage they can do. Survey says Aichi Wawa. Woo! Ouch. Well, they apparently were ready. They brought their A game with them. Well, you know what? Let's just back out a little bit, make it easier. There we go. So there's three hits. And then the leader. Oh. Unfortunately, they couldn't really kind of finish the job. They got a two, but they did get three hits. Now, when you score hits, you basically have to do hits on a like-for-like -like basis. So, like, if there's elephants present, elephants hit each other. Regular infantry hits each other first before they hit levies, etc., etc., etc. Okay? So, two hits on red infantry. And then three hits Ooh, on yellow. Yikes. 
All right, now, after a round of combat, the defender can decide if he wants to retreat. After the defender decides, the attacker can decide. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If both sides choose not to fight another battle, they can coexist in the same province. But again, remember, nobody gets anything if that's the case. So, otherwise, if one person wants to keep fighting, then they can go ahead and keep fighting. Now, in this particular situation here, Red obviously is not going to retreat. They're in pretty good shape there. They got the most hits, feeling pretty confident. Plus, they got a nice strong contingent down here to just the south in, um, what is this? Uh, Assyria. So, I mean, they can easily fill the vacuum if they need to, or they could strike into North Syria here. Not that supply matters in this game. There's no lines of supply or anything like that. Um, again, this is a very simple beer and pretzels kind of game. But losing your leader can have a very bad effect on the game because when a leader is lost, um, that basically turns into, if I remember correctly here, then you end up with ransom. Um, yeah, leader's captured. You must be ransomed back to the owner. And I believe it costs five talents in order to do that. But let me just double check here. Yeah, right. Right, so you don't want to lose your leader. Because then, yeah, like I said, that's one of the ways you place combat. Yet. So you know what? I'm going to be prudent here and say that my Armenian invasion failed and fall back into North Syria. And then that's the end of your turn once you're done with your combat stage. Okay? All right, let's find out now, among the other three factions, who gets to go next. Survey says, oh, it's the green faction that gets to go next. So green will have the next one here. And let's find out what random event they're going to get, what chart they're going to deal with. Okay, it's even again. And this time it is 13. So let's see. Even event table, 13. Hey, the roller receives two talents. Woohoo! Green needs that because green is in bad shape, man. Um, so far, they've been able to protect themselves from blue because blue has basically not had a chance to really build anything. Again, like I said, those barbarian invasions have really been crippling them this game. But, you know, with red and yellow on their doorstep and both of them fairly strong, uh, that is an issue. Okay. Now, sometimes with events, and I mentioned this before, um, sometimes they'll say a draw a chit. There's 20 chits in a cuff, which is a lot of chit when you think about it, um, that you could draw and use. And some of them do things like this number 12. It's all on the paper. It um, tells you what you can do with it. And this particular one, you can change the order of play, which, since I'm playing solo like this, that basically, if I spend it for red, then if red doesn't like... You know, the die roll, the, the initiative die roll, if they want to have it a re-roll, then they can go ahead and do that. Um, that's how I'll spend that shit, if that becomes necessary. Okay, so, I got myself a couple of talents. Woo that's cool. I'm cheering myself on as the green. Mr. Green. In the study. Okay. Alright, so now, again, we'll just total up revenue. Here we go. So, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. This one goes to 11 which gives me a total of 13. But, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 13 minus 6 is 7. Because I need to maintain what I've got. Now, here's the thing. I know it's green, I've got problems. And I know there's big armies waiting for me. So what I'm going to do is basically, I think, unfortunately it's green, I'm going to have to try and consolidate this turn. Maybe try to pick up um, another point of revenue. Maybe I'll go up to... Whew, Paphlagonia, which would be better than Bithynia, because Bithynia only is worth one um, there. But I don't feel strong enough as green to attack anybody. So let's spend those seven talents. I'm going to spend them all. Um, I'm going to spend three on cavalry, and then two on infantry, that's five, and then I'll get two levies. Six, seven. So I'm going to put most of those guys, I'm going to put one in my capital, Phrygia, which I've got protected pretty well. And then I'll put the others uh, out here to kind of try and defend myself. Or put myself at least in a position where I can strike back. Um, 
against whoever moves on me first. And again, this is where, to me anyway, part of the fun is with the initiative die roll because next turn you don't know who's going to get to go first. Why well, get a chance to go before yellow? That kind of thing. So let me move these guys up here. That'll give me one more revenue point. I have no talent whatsoever. Mm, that's life. And now we move on to the next initiative roll, which is between red and blue. And blue gets it, so red will end up going last this turn. All right, again, rail roll for your random event. Let's see what we get. Whoa, got trip fives. So it's odd table and 55. I can drive 55. Crit plague. Holy smoke. All right, so the province currently containing the most combat units suffers a plague. If tied, all such provinces suffer the plague. Roll one die per combat unit, and if you roll six, bye bye Thanks for playing. All right, now let's see. That might be Yellow's army. Two, four. They've got four there. Um, oh, shoot. You know what? It's my buildup. Ah, figures. Um, unfortunately, it says the province with the most units. Earlier in the game, it was actually these neutral guys, these um, armies from the Kingdom of India that invaded. But, um, ah, sugar, 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 sugar. All right. Here we go. Let's get rolling. All right. So let me roll for my two cavalry units first. Uh, ooh, that was close. It was two fives. All right. I roll for my two infantry. A five and a one. Okay, okay, okay. Hang it in there, hang it in there, hang it in there. And now my leg. Perfect. So, fortunately for me, no harm, no foul. Okay, so now red will total up their revenue here. So, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. So they have thirteen points. But again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11. Yikes. They only have two talents left. Ooh. They really need to expand somewhere. Well, with only two talents left, I think what I'm going to do is focus on conquering new territory. So I'm going to buy one levy. When the levy breaks. <laughs> For all you Zep fans out there. And I'll go ahead and put it here with the leader in Armenia. And all I'm going to do is have him drive up into the Caucasus because I want the two value province there. That's it. All right, and I'm done. Okay, Blue's turn. So let's see what Blue can pull off. All right, it's even, and it's 63. Oh, you know what that means. Even table, 63. We got some chit going on. So here we go, chit pull. I mean, of course, rather than initiative die roll, you could do this with chits, but I just like the dice better. So we pulled chit number five. Now, typically when I pull a chit, I put it in the controlling powers home province. Let's see what chit number five has to say. Lydian neutrality. May only be played on game turns one through five. Oh, man, it's turn six. Wow. So we don't even have to worry about that. <laughs> All right. So that one's kind of worthless. We'll just throw it back into the... That's one thing that the, the rules are not clear on. And I, I, I've looked at them a couple of times. Let me look at them again with you one more time. But when it comes to events... Uh, see, it says about chits drawn can be held. Such time to be held by the drawer. Okay, to the conditions or when they wish to do them. Um... But it doesn't say, like, do you put them back in the cup or do you take them out of the game? I'm tempted to take this one out of the game because it's only good for turns one through five. Okay, And, of course, this is the case with a lot of older games. No disrespect to any designers from back in the day. But sometimes you just kind of have to use your own common sense on that. So I'm going to pull that one out of the game from now on. There's no point because it's only good for turns one through five and more on turn six. That's another thing about this game is it doesn't go on forever. You know, it's limited to ten turns. So. Okay. So, blue, we're going to check their revenue over here and see what we're going to do with them. So, they have four, six, eight. They have 11. Okay, 12 altogether because they had one in the bank. And then one, two, 
three, four, five. So 11 minus five is six. So they got a lot of money to spend. Okay, partly because they had to march their army here for Macedonia because there was a massive uh, barbarian invasion. Okay, now fleets. Fleets can move up to five movement points. Infantry can move up to three movement points. So let's just talk about that right now um, because blue, I don't know if I'll move them this turn, but I might move them next turn. Um, but basically, you can move fleets and infantry in any combination uh, that you wish. Okay. Uh, basically, you can embark your infantry at a port. I think it does have to be a port, but let me just make sure. Um, you can transport one unit, so it's basically a one-for-one -one ratio, plus any leaders, okay, to do that. Um, doesn't cost anything to embark and disembark, okay. Um, and you can disembark even if there's no port present. All right. <laughs> now, fleets can also stay out in the water and basically be on patrol, or they can block enemy ports too if you want to. If we want to do that sort of thing. So technically, I could come down and block the port of Egypt and basically force them to have to come out and attack if they want to move that fleet out of there. But um, I'm, I'm more interested, quite frankly, I would be more interested in an in invasion from the sea rather than, you know, blocking. Because um, Egypt is just, the, the Yellow Empire, the Egyptian Empire, is just getting way, way, way too big. Okay. Um, and if you do an invasion, um, there's just slight differences. There's no pre-battle um, resolution, and the defender gets to roll two dice per unit um, if all the units are attacking from the sea. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So let me see here. I've got seven. I could build some guys. And I'm just trying to double check and make sure. I thought for sure... You had to pick them up. They had to be in a port to pick them up. Doesn't cost. They can disembark in any province or sea zone, even if there's no port. Um, okay. But see, now that seems to imply that you need to be in a port to pick up. Um, to pick up people. Because it said doesn't, you can disembark anywhere. Even if no port is present. But it doesn't say they can embark, so it must need a port. But the good thing is, here in southern Greece, or the Greece province, there is a port symbol. So, Okay, so let me go ahead and build some units here. And then I'll need to decide if I want to try a sea invasion. Um, maybe I'll try and invade Libya. Be really bold here. So we got seven talents. I'm going to get three infantry. And I'm going to get... Um, I'll get one levy. Because I do want to put some troops up on the border to try and secure that. You know what? I'm going to do a sea invasion just to show you how it works. I don't think I'll send the leader, though. All right. So we'll put those guys in the home province here. Okay. And... Well, actually, maybe I should send the leader, huh? Yeah. Of course, I could just invade Crete and get the money from Crete. That's true. Um... Hmm. Nah, you know what? Just for the fun of it, let's do a sea invasion. Why not? And we'll send the leader just for the fun of it. All right, so I'll have him pick up two infantry. Or I'll have two infantry move down there with him, with the two fleets. And then one, two, three. Let's three. We're going to land over here in Cyrencia. And then I'm going to move this one levy up here to Yoria, just in case that a random event comes up again with the barbarian invasions. So... Okay, so they're going to disembark down here. There's no pre-battle resolution, and the defender gets to roll two dice. Oops, sorry, I thought that was in the shot. My apologies. Okay, so the defenders, they rolled a five and a three, so they did manage to score one hit. On the invaders, the invaders, of course, the one infantry unit will roll a five. They need to get five or six, and then, of course, the other one has... Four, five, or six, because we have the leader with them. And we did manage to get one hit out of that mess as well. So, both sides lost a unit, but the invasion was successful. Now, the question will be, and again, this is what kind of the fun of the chip pool, 
the initiative die roll comes in, who is going to get to move first next turn? Will Yellow have a chance to build... <laughs> now I sound like the old Batman show. Will Yellow have a chance to build new units and crush them? Can Blue march across over to Africa? <laughs> get some more troops transported by water too, right? Okay. So, whoops, I spent there all seven of their talents. So they're back down in there, and actually I spent Yellow's talents too. i got to do a better job of keeping track of that at times. Red saved one talent, though. I know that for sure. Okay, that's a complete turn. So now we would move on to turn seven. And start all over again. Figure out which of the four powers will go first. All right. So I think that gives you a good feel of how the game is played. Um... And again, as you can see, this is very much a, a beer and pretzels game. There's nothing too complicated here, but it is fun to pull out from time to time. I've kept it over the years. I play it on a number of occasions when I start to get to the Ancient Warfare, which, by the way, just as fair warning to y'all, um, you might want to buckle your seatbelt on the Ancient War stuff because I think I might be hanging out there for a while. Um, because right now I just got um, Pyrrhus Imperator. Uh, from, I think I'm pronouncing this right, Vivictus magazine from France uh, with the English translation rules. And I think I'm going to highlight that one next after I have a chance to kind of work that through. It's an interesting little system, so I'm going to need a little time on that um, to do that. Uh, but I have some other ancient games that I could also highlight. Of course, I've already done Field Commander Alexander, but I do have um, the Ancient World 1 and 2, Rise of the Roman Republic, and um, Carthage First Punic War. Uh, but I also have, because I did the Kickstarter on this, I have tucked away over here with the giant map, uh, the Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. And mostly, I'll be honest with you, the reason I really did that was because they added the um, the Hamilcar. I think it was. I think that's the name they went with for the um, uh, for the first Punic War. So taking that system and then. Being able to play it with the first Punic War was a big appeal to me as to why I went ahead and picked it up. And as you can see from the beginning of this, I also have the the GMT, what used to be Avalon Hill, the big successor game, the card-driven game, which you know I could mess with that too. But I don't have a lot of ancient games anymore because I got away from set piece battles. So you know I used to have games that you know was like I used to do um, oh all great battles of history series. I had tons of those. Um, I think I had almost a complete set at one point, and I sold them as a complete set years ago. Um, I think around the time my first son was born. So, um, yeah, I went ahead and sold it and got it out of the way, because I just don't really care for set-piece battles too much anymore, every once in a while. But um, there's very few set-piece battles in my collection at this point. So, like I said, um, I, I intend, unless something funky happens, I intend to highlight Pyrrhus, Pyrrhus Imperator um, next, and then, you know, maybe I'll mess around with some other ancient ones. Um, of course, GMT's reissue of Mark Herman's um, The Peloponnesian War is coming out, which I already did a video on, but I might do a video on the new one, just, you know, to see the differences and and things of that nature. Although I understand, and this is just from skimming things, that there's not a whole lot of difference. So we'll see. But um, anyway, so um, if you're looking for a multiplayer, you know, easy breezy, ancient, fun um, game, this would be a good one uh, to do. Again, I, I mean, I've kept this, you know, I bought this quite a while ago, um, probably 15 or 20 years ago. Not, not maybe 20, more like 15 years ago. And it's, it stood the test of time for me because um, I enjoy it. So, all right. So that's kind of the deal here now. So we'll see what happens as we roll on down the road here. Oh, I have Chariot Lords too. I forgot about picking that up at one point. And we'll look at that too maybe. Who knows? We'll see. I'll have to pull it out and dust it off. Can't literally dust it off. <laughs> and that's, that's not a that's not a figurative. <laughs> that's a literal statement. All right. So, successors here from the old s &T game from the early 90s. Again, good beer and pretzels game. It really shines with the, with the events because there are, and again, just to give you a full shot here, I mean, just look at all those events. And that's just the odd tables. 
There's the even ones. And then, of course, there's also the chip table. But still, that's a lot of different events that could throw the game off, cause chaos, etc., etc. And again, if you play multiplayer and you're making alliances and backstabbing and double-crossing people and stuff, it can be an absolute blast. I have fun with it solo. I can see where multiplayer would be totally cool. So, All right, so this is Tim Korchner from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching, and we'll see you again with the Eagle. The Eagle has landed in Rome and see if uh, Pyrrhus can successfully beat the Roman Republic this time around. As always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.